The History of Recreational Diving by Dr. Franz Cronier. Man has always held a fascination for the beauty and mystery of the sea. Fired by a desire to embrace its charm and challenge its fury, we engage in various pursuits from sailing its surface to delving its depths. The latter, diving, has a special appeal to all of us. Its history is a remarkable tale of the triumph of human ingenuity over environmental adversity, a battle against all odds. And so it is that the history of diving features three collections of people. Those who captured the imagination of mankind and kindled our desire to enter the sea. Those who invented the equipment and diving techniques to overcome the many physiological and physical barriers. And those who bravely and often foolishly applied these ideas and methods to pave the way to what is now called recreational diving. The word scuba has fairly recent origins. The acronym Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus started as military jargon coined by the US Navy Underwater Demolition Team. As used today, the term scuba distinguishes self-contained devices from surface supply diving, diving habitats, hard hat diving, and one atmosphere submersible vessels and containers. The origins of diving are lost in antiquity. The first record is actually found in the Persian epic of Gilgamesh, dating back to 3000 before Common Era. Here description is given of how the hero retrieves oysters to restore lost youth to a man. The next chronological reference is to a Greek sponge diver, Glaucus, who apart from his successful sponge diving exploits, also has the dubious honor of drowning. Rather than admitting this rather humiliating truth, his peers elevate him to the status of a god. Ancient Persian friezes, dated around 865 before Common Era, depict men swimming with some sort of breathing bag, either for flotation or perhaps the first primitive breathing apparatus. By 600 before Common Era, sponge diving had become a very important industry in early Greece, and this is depicted on a lot of the ceramic art of that time. Two of these early Greek divers were a father and daughter team, Silius and Sayama. Employed by King Xerxes of Persia, they assisted with the recovery of goods from sunken ships. Unfortunately for the king, he refused to allow them to return after many years of loyal service, so they retaliated by cutting the anchor lines during a storm and destroyed his navy. In the 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci drafted various diving contraptions, including the first known scuba equipment. It was captured in his Codex Atlanticus. Da Vinci's design combined air supply and buoyancy control in a single system. It foreshadowed later diving suits. There's no evidence that he ever built the device, although modern reconstructions can be seen here. He himself, having abandoned scuba in favor of refining the diving bell, which offered both protection and endurance in the era preceding compressed air. In 1622, a Spanish treasure fleet on its way home was scattered and largely destroyed by a hurricane near the Florida Keys. The Spaniards salvaged a small part of the treasure with a custom-built diving bell, but most was never recovered. Storms continued harassing the treasure transport between 1715 and 1733, with hundreds of people drowning. The economic losses intensified Spain's national deficit and accelerated its decline as a world power. The lure of sunken treasure remained an incentive to enter the sea for the next 350 years, although the search rendered more people poor than it did rich. The change from bells to whistles, if you like, came when a German physicist, engineer and natural philosopher, Otto von Gericke, invented the first air pump to study the phenomenon of vacuum and the role of air in combustion and respiration. His invention also, for the first time, allowed air and gas to be pumped to pressures greater than one atmosphere, either to supply a dive underwater or for storage as compressed gas. However, in the absence of materials to contain compressed gas, efforts continued to provide a continuous supply of gas to the diver at depth. However, in 1680, an Italian physician, Giovanni Borelli, imagined a close-circuit rebreather. His drawings show a giant bag using chemical components to regenerate the exhaled air. This, he suggested, should allow the air to be breathed again by a submerged diver. Borelli also drew rather bizarre claw-like feet 
on his diver, which some suggested may have been the first renditions of swim fins and the metamorphosis to becoming frogmen. In 1808, Friedrich von Drieberg developed a device he called the Triton. The system used an air reservoir worn by the diver, but because it could not contain sufficient pressure to provide enough duration, it still had to be supplied by surface hoses. The diver could obtain air from the backpack reservoir through a valve operated by nodding his head forward. Then in 1819, two brothers, Charles and John Dean, employed as merchant seamen, designed a smoke helmet to fight fires in ships. Although the original concept failed, the invention became the blueprint of the most successful diving system to date, the hard hat or standard dress. Without the capital or manufacturing skills, they approached their employer, who eventually contracted a German coppersmith and inventor in London, Augustus Seabee. After producing the first smoke helmet, Seabee's interests turned to diving. By 1836, he had introduced the concept of closed dress, that is, sealing the helmet to the suit to prevent flooding. So successful was his system that it was used in the salvage of the Royal George in 1839, from the harbour at Spithead, England. This won CB the endorsement of Her Majesty's Royal Navy and established his firm, CB and later CB Gorman and Company, as the leading manufacturer of diving equipment in the world. Many parallel efforts were underway as materials and artisan skills started to better support man's dream to enter the sea. In 1825, an Englishman, William James, developed what several historians considered to be the first true scuba. It employed tanks of compressed air and a full diving dress with a helmet. Limits on useful depth and duration kept it from widespread adoption by commercial divers, who eventually favoured Seabee's standard dress. Then in 1864, two Frenchmen, Benoit Recarol and Auguste Denerouze, developed the first demand valve. The diver carried a tank on the back, fed from the surface, from which the diver could obtain air through an ambient pressure compensating, membrane-controlled demand valve. The diver was able to breathe with minimal effort, and their system of surface pump, pressurized air cylinder and demand regulators went into commercial production in 1867. This was the first recorded respirator-controlled demand valve in history, and is similar to the one used in modern scuba. Jules Verne added intrigue to the quest for depth in 20,000 leagues under the sea. In 1869, he had Captain Nemo, his crew, using the Rockerol Denaru system with the next inevitable development, independence from the surface. The building of the Brooklyn Bridge in New York introduced Caisson's disease, or the bends, for the first time. These clinical labels for the misfortune of human effervescence following prolonged exposure to compressed air were eventually transferred to the field of diving when diving systems were able to offer a combination of depth and duration that was able to cause this phenomenon. This was to remain one of the primary occupational hazards to divers for the next 25 years. Following the discovery of oxygen, R.A. Fluss, an English merchant seaman, revived the idea of closed circuit rebreathers in 1876. His self-contained system was useful for working in smoke and noxious air environments and for short periods underwater. Fluss ultimately went to work as an engineer for C.B. Gorman, who put his design into commercial production. Paul Baer, French physiologist, was able to tie many loose ends in the evolving fields of diving and aviation medicine. In his monumental work, Barometric Pressure, using simple but elegant experiments, he recognized nitrogen as the cause of Caisson's disease, concluded that it was the same affliction as decompression sickness in divers, and even predicted its occurrence at altitude. He recommended breathing oxygen as a remedy, and accordingly he should be recognized as the first Dan oxygen provider. However, his experiences with oxygen toxicity convulsions under pressure, which were credited to him as the Paul Bear effect, prohibited him from recommending the combination of oxygen and pressure in the treatment of decompression sickness. In 1892, Louis Bouton perfects the first underwater camera system and shows an excited world the first pictures of the Big Blue. 
One of the key milestones in the development of diving safety is represented by British physiologist John Scott Haldane. By approaching nitrogen uptake from a pharmacological principle and doing to goats what the Swiss have done to cheese, he provided Homo aquaticus with a concept of stage decompression and the production of the first useful dive tables. In 1909, the Draeger Company of Lübeck in Germany, a manufacturer of gas valves, firefighting equipment and mine safety devices, plunged into diving gear. The company created a self-contained dive system combining a hard hat style helmet with a backpack containing compressed oxygen. Building on its success and stimulated by the First World War, Draeger quickly took the lead in developing the first modern rebreathers from 1917, combining tanks containing a mixture of compressed air and oxygen, which would be the first enriched air nitrox. The devices were sold for use at depths to 40 meters, or 130 feet, and Draeger devices remained the leading rebreathers in most military and research applications for many years thereafter. The original scimitographic version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by the Williamson brothers appeared in 1915 and provided the world with a first glimpse of the commercial use of underwater cinematography. Cast and crew used modified Fleurs rebreathers and oxalite, a compound that generates oxygen through a chemical reaction. Unfortunately, oxalite explodes if it gets wet, a trait that limited its popularity a little. Then, in 1926, an officer of the French Navy, Yves Lepreur, patents the Fernet Lepreur diving system based on compressed air carried in tanks. Lepreur's device feeds air to a full face mask worn by the diver. This was the first system to open scuba diving to the public and resulted in the forming of the first scuba club. Then, in 1937, the American Diving Equipment and Salvage Company, now known as DESCO, developed a self-contained mixed gas rebreather system with the expertise of basement genius Dr. Edgar End in Milwaukee. It used a compressed mixture of helium and oxygen in combination with a fully sealed diving suit. And then using the new system, DESCO diver Max Knoll set a new world record of 420 feet. Desco was also the U.S. manufacturer of C.B. Gorman's equivalent hard hat, the U.S. Navy Mark V, which was only discontinued in 1983. In 1939, Owen Churchill helped to popularize skin diving by introducing the Churchill dive fins. The next cinema landmark is provided by John Wayne in 1942. In Cecil DeMille's Reap the Whirlwind, he plays the role of a hard hat salvage diver who eventually is done in by a giant squid at the end. Cinematographer Victor Milne is nominated for an Academy Award, but only the squid wins an Oscar for special effects. Then, in 1943, Jacques Cousteau and industrial gas control systems engineer with Air Liquide, Emile Gagnard, combine their talents and insights and provide the world with what was to become one of the most popular scuba devices, the Aqualung, or Twin Hose Regulator. During the summer of 44, Cousteau and two close friends, Philippe Tallier and Frédéric Dumas, test production prototypes of the Cousteau Gagnard scuba system in the Mediterranean Sea. The device proves to be safe, reliable, and remarkably easy to use. Dumas demonstrates the safety of the device by diving to 210 feet, and later that same year, their first film, 60 feet down, is released. René Bussos then starts importing the Aqualung to Southern California through René's Sporting Goods, which ultimately becomes U.S. Divers. A leading manufacturer of diving equipment and scuba diving starts to take the U.S. by storm. From 1950 to 1960, there was an explosion of activity. Entrepreneurs and businessmen turned their focus to the evolving industry of diving. The promotion awakened public interest and began to shape the world of recreational diving. Different versions of the Aqualung started to appear. In 1951, Chuck Blakesley and Jim Orzier created Skin Diver magazine. And Skin Diver immediately became a leading journal of spearfishing and underwater hunting. Many early Skin Divers refused to use the new bubble machines and looked on scuba as a sissy diving technique. 
But in later years, the magazine shifted its attention to scuba as this became more popular. Skin Diver played an important role in nurturing the industry growth by promoting underwater photography and travel. In 1951, a European manufacturer produced a new tank valve with a reserve mechanism. The first US diver catalogue in 1953 designated this valve with the letter J, and it then became known as the J valve. Its catalogue companion, the non-reserve device, is still known as the K valve. In 1951, Rachel Carson publishes The Sea Around Us, a scholarly and poetic book about the oceans wins several prestigious awards and tops bestseller lists for almost seven months. Today, more than 40 years later, the sea around us continues to win new friends for the marine environment. Also 1951, John Steinbeck publishes The Log from the Sea of Cortez. His book chronicles a 1940 research and collecting expedition undertaken by Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts. It attracts many adventurers to scuba diving and the area is promoted for dive travel. Still continuing in the 1950s, Hans Huss starts to riddle the expectant world with books and films on diving. Hans Huss becomes a role model for the diving public. 1952. Jacques Cousteau, Frédéric Dumas and James Dugan publish Silent World, a book about the early days of the Aqualung. It too becomes a bestseller. The film is released four years later in 1956. 1953, Dr. Eugenie Clark publishes Lady with a Spear. It becomes a Book of the Month Club selection and is translated into eight languages, even Braille. The popular book gives women divers a role model of their own. 1954, the first full textbook of recreational diving appears, The Science of Skin Scuba Diving, published by the Council for National Cooperation in Aquatics. By 1974, when the fourth edition was published, more than a million copies were sold. Still 1954, research diver Zale Parry gives the world of television its first underwater documentary series, Kingdom of the Sea. The program includes live broadcasts of diver education, the same year, Perry makes a record-setting dive to 209 feet near Catalina Island with national publicity. 1955, Jane Russell, Richard Egan and Gilbert Rowland star in a Howard Hughes film, Underwater. Promotional posters featuring glamour girl Jane Mansfield attract audiences for other than aquatic interests, but nevertheless the film promotes the sport and the guests actually wear scuba gear to the premiere. 1955, Sam Davidson Jr. introduces Dialer Breath, a double hose, double diaphragm regulator, complete with built-in low pressure reserve and variable breathing resistance. Davidson goes on to build his own equipment manufacturing company, Decor. 1956, a group of scientists at the University of California invent the new type of outerwear for divers, the fabric, a neoprene foam manufactured by Rubitex as automobile insulation providers, helps wet but warm divers and becomes the wet suit. 1956, Ted Nixon introduces a distinctive red and white diver down flag to warn boaters to stay clear and slow down to avoid injuring nearby divers. Then between 1958 and 1961, Sea Hunt, produced by Ivan Tours, is photographed by Lamar Boren and becomes one of America's most popular television series. The exploits of Mike Nelson, played by Lloyd Bridges, makes the character a role model for future generations of scuba divers. 1959. The YMCA's National Aquatic Council offers the first nationwide diver training and certification program in the United States. In the same year, CMAS is formed in Monaco. These two organizations lead the growth spurt in recreational diving in the United States and Europe. 
21 years later, in early 1980, YMCA scuba is granted equivalency by CMAS for YMCA qualified scuba instructors and divers. This distinction positions YMCA as part of the world's largest diving organization, composed of some 12,000 diving clubs, 65 national federations and 3.5 million divers. 1959, the Boston-based Northeast Council of Dive Clubs hosts the first national convention of skin divers. The group forms an umbrella organization representing many diving clubs, councils and constituencies, the Underwater Society of America. Then in 1960, Chuck Blakesley, Jim Auxier and Neil Hess decide to hold a major instructor certification course. They invite Al Tillman, director of the Los Angeles County Underwater Program to design and direct its course. The National Diving Patrol is renamed the National Association of Underwater Instructors, NAWI, and is incorporated as a non-profit organization. Tillman becomes the first president and Hess the executive secretary. The course qualifies 53 of 67 candidates and becomes the first international instructor certification course in history and marks a whole new era in sport diving. Over the next three and a half decades, Nawi goes through many organizational changes, becoming Nawi Worldwide in 1996, moving its world headquarters to Tampa, Florida, and accepting international representatives on its board of directors. The BZAC is formed in London in autumn of 1953. The British Sub Aqua Club founder is Oscar Guggen and is assisted by Peter Small, who tragically dies a few years later during a thousand-foot dive with Hans Keller. The BZAC quickly becomes a significant force in sport diving. During 1959, BZAC becomes a founding member of CMAS. BZAC has some 45,000 members, which makes it the largest single diving club in the world. In 1961, Maurice Fenzi patents a device invented by the underwater research group of the French Navy. It rapidly becomes the first commercially successful buoyancy compensator. Within a few years, divers throughout Europe and a few well-traveled Americans start wearing Fenzies. 1964, Richard Adcock launches the first dedicated liverboard dive boat in Mexico. Liverboards have since become one of the mainstays of recreational diving. Then between 1962 and 1966, several underwater habitat experiments provide publicity to diving and offer the world a glimpse of underwater experimentation and research. E.A. Link becomes the man in the sea with an experimental 24-hour dive on Heliox to 200 feet. And Jacques Cousteau conducts Con Shelf 1 with a habitat housing six men breathing oxygen enriched air, which is nitrox, at 35 feet for seven days. Conshelf 2 and 3 follow, as does Hydrolab. In 1964, the US Navy launches Sea Lab 1. In the first experiment, under the watchful eye of Captain George Bond, four divers stay underwater for 11 days at an average depth of 193 feet. This is followed by Sea Lab 2 in 1965, with team leader Scott Carpenter living and working in the habitat at a depth of 205 feet. Scott amazes the world when he speaks to astronaut Gordon Cooper in a Gemini spacecraft orbiting 200 miles above the Earth's surface. 1965, Al Tillman develops the UNESCO diving resort at Freeport in the Bahamas. Created at the dawn of the jet age, it soon becomes a major attraction for teaching, diving and a magnet for traveling divers. UNESCO becomes the prototype of a complete dedicated dive travel destination. Also 1965, Thunderball, starring Sean Connery. This glamorizes and updates the image of scuba diving with waves of diving extras. Diving retailers are faced with the challenge of providing customers with scuba gear just like James Bond's. The special visual effects win an Academy Award. 1966, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors Paddy is formed by John Cronin and Ralph Erickson. Ericsson develops the idea of continuing education. John Cronin passes away in 2003 to be replaced by Drew Richardson, the current president of PADI. 1967, the Undersea Medical Society, now known as the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society, or UHMS, is founded in Maryland. The UHMS and its members 
will significantly advance the knowledge of medical aspects of diving. In 1970, John McCannaff and the University of Rhode Island created a National Underwater Accident Data Center. The statistics and accident information gathered, analyzed and reported by McCannaff advanced industry awareness of many aspects of diving safety. And in July 1970, President Nixon proposed creating a National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to serve a national need for better protection of life and property from natural hazards, for better understanding of total environment and for exploration and development leading to the intelligent use of our marine resources. On the 3rd of October, NOAA is established under the Department of Commerce. In addition to serving the country through timely and precise weather, water and climate forecasts, managing fisheries, building healthy coastlines and monitoring changes in the oceans, NOAA also becomes one of the springboards for professional diving activities and the origins of nitrox and technical diving through the efforts of Morgan Wells and Dick Krakowski. 1970, the macho image of underwater exploration is forever curved when marine biologist Dr. Sylvia Earle leads a highly publicized mission in the tektite habitat. Earle's all-female team of aquanauts successfully complete a two-week saturation stay at 42 feet, providing researchers with much valuable data. 1972, the US Congress passes the Marine Protection, Research and Sanctuaries Act. The Act recognizes that marine sanctuaries are part of our collective riches as a nation and charges NOAA with managing the program. Today the system embraces 13 sites, many of which are havens for divers as well as fish. Then a setback arrives. The setback comes in the form of Hollywood's release of Jaws in 1975. Steven Spielberg's rendition of Peter Benchley's book chases people out of the water in droves, ending 15 consecutive years of industry growth. Aftershocks echo in 1977 with The Deep and in 1978 and 83 with Jaws 2 and 3. Although already formed in 1963, the National Trade Association and Diving Equipment Manufacturers Association, DEMA, hosts its first trade show in Miami in 1977. The show establishes itself as neutral ground where the entire industry can meet, and DEMA becomes a potent force for professionalism and unity within recreational diving industry, based on the mission of promoting, fostering and advancing the common business interests of its members as manufacturers of diving equipment. In 1983, co-inventors Craig Bashinger and Carl Huggins, with Orca Industries founder Jim Fulton, introduce The Edge, the first commercially successful American electronic dive computer. It's released at the DEMA trade show, and the device automatically tracks dives and continuously calculates remaining no decompression time and depth limits. It helps spark a new era in dive instrumentation. In 1984 and 85, American popular culture shows a revived affection for the underwater world when two movies, Splash and Cocoon, portray the ocean as a revitalizing, nurturing environment, featuring lovingly photographed underwater scenes. From then to today, the various recreational diving training organizations continue to provide entry to the aquatically inclined. Through different businesses and educational nuances, these organizations provide a safe metamorphosis for Homo scubiensis. The recreational diving industry continues to evolve, with a growing emphasis on underwater photography, video and children in diving. The cutting edge of modern recreational diving lies in technical diving, and technical diving involves greater depths, gas switching and gas mixing and therefore is very equipment intensive. To deal with this increased demand for specialized training, three training organizations are founded the International Association of Nitrox and Technical Divers by Tom Mount, the Technical Diving International Organization by Brett Gillam, and CMAS Technical Diving Certification Program. 
with the need to accommodate greater depths, multi-level, multi-day and now multi-gas diving, further refinements are made to decompression computers and they provide more robust and sophisticated decompression algorithms. These devices are still trying to get to grips with the discrepancies between mathematics and physiology. There's much more to the history of diving and technical diving in particular, but at this point we would like to shift gears and look at another development related to recreational diving.